This is lecture 10. In the previous lecture, we went over size principle uh, from a historical perspective and from a physiological perspective. Today, we'll cover it from a practical perspective. Uh, again, we just finished going over the mechanisms of orderly recruitment or size principle, meaning sequential recruitment of small to large motor units. Uh, we went over how that works and why it works. In this lecture, we'll talk about some practical applications, uh, ways to improve your performance on the field uh, or on the court or on the diamond, uh, on the ice, on the track, in a pool, you know, maybe in the air if what you play is an aerial sport. Whatever your athletic context and environment, we'll cover a few practical applications, not exclusively about size principle, but related to the content that we've covered so far. As a reminder, we have motor units that are packed with horsepower, uh, but they get terrible gas mileage and they can only run briefly. Those are your high threshold motor units, a bunch of type two fibers that are hard to recruit, but they're really fast and strong. Uh, and then we have the low threshold motor units, uh, the reliable, fuel efficient ones. They don't have nearly as much horsepower, but they're way better commuter cars. These are your type one fibers. Uh, and what's important is that we use whichever motor units are appropriate to the task. You don't want to drop off the kids at school in a funny car, uh, but you don't want to go to the drag strip in a Volvo either. And, and ensuring that your uh, skeletal muscle recruitment is fit to the task is really what orderly recruitment or size principle is doing. So let's begin an exercise program. Okay, it's New Year's Day, it's a New Year's resolution. We've never done resistance training before, uh, but we've resolved to increase muscle size and strength. Um, so on day one, we start exercising. Okay, we're lifting weights uh, and we keep lifting on days you know, two and four and five and seven, eight, nine, 11, 13, 14, 16, and so on. We, we lift weights regularly. Um, we're going to get stronger almost immediately, gradually, but right at the onset of exercise, strength starts increasing. Size doesn't though. That takes some time. So how do we get stronger without any growth in our muscles? At the onset of exercise, it's mostly neural adaptations. Uh, the withdrawal of neural inhibition is a major contributor. Um, GABA, gamma amino butyric acid, is the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter in your central nervous system. Uh, it's a major player in the police force of skeletal muscle actions uh, in mature brains. It plays excitatory roles during development, but this isn't a developmental class. Um, but how GABA inhibits neurons is by hyperpolarizing them. It permits chloride, which is negatively charged, to enter the neuron. Uh, we've seen hyperpolarization before in the refractory periods following action potentials, um, but GABA isn't the only neurotransmitter that matters. Uh, it's synthesized from glutamate, and, and glutamate is the primary excitatory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. Uh, and vitamin B6 is a cofactor in that synthesis. And there are some studies that, that show supplementation um, associating with increased GABA and, and indications that maybe it helps with anxiety. Um, but what about peripheral effects, more regional neuronal changes? You'll see several changes to the neuromuscular junction, uh, the architecture of it, as well as changes in synaptic vesicles and the acetylcholine receptors on the motor end plate. Uh, those findings tend to use treadmill adaptations, but this study, uh, this was evaluating resistance training in rats. They were, they were climbing ladders with a weight attached to their tails. Um, but the timing of the changes, that's the important finding here. Uh, the morphological changes to the neuromuscular junction, pre and post synaptic changes, those occurred independently uh, of hypertrophy. So the neuronal changes precede growth. Now, there are other uh, contributors too. The Golgi tendon organ may become more lax uh, in its role. Rate coding is likely to ramp up. Um, ratios between uh, agonist and antagonist recruitment, uh, those will improve. Lots of neuronal changes. 
Um, but why would we rely on these things to improve as opposed to just getting bigger, letting our muscles fill up with some more actin and myosin? Just like size principle, uh, there's a metabolic efficiency to doing it this way. It's really expensive, really metabolically expensive to synthesize protein. Um, hypertrophy bears an enormous cost. Uh, so this is one way of improving in performance without committing a large budget. Uh, but then just like any good private enterprise, uh, after you've consumed your trial budget, your body will start allocating real resources to the pursuit. And that's protein synthesis. That's hypertrophy. So how long will it take before real tissue remodeling occurs? Um, that's tough to estimate because it depends on the person, right? It depends on their genetics. It depends on their age. It depends on the exercises they're performing um, and the frequency. It depends on uh, nutrition, you know, maybe an average estimation, maybe six weeks, something like that before you see hypertrophy really beginning. Um, now there will be protein synthesis that happens early, but it's just remodeling back to baseline. It's gluing Humpty Dumpty pieces back together. It's not making Humpty all buff and like yoked with an L in it. Um, I mean, there may be a little bit of cross-sectional area changes, kind of general size changes, um, but that's, you know, maybe there's some connective tissue mass, but, and there's a bunch of swelling, right, that's happening. It's not real muscle mass, actin and myosin, and, and, and for that, you have to show some fortitude, right? You have to keep at it for a month or two before Voldemort here starts to grow. Uh, now, in those workouts... Uh, whatever you're doing in the gym, think about how size principle might influence your training results, uh, whether hypertrophy happens at all. Um, this is something we'll talk about in detail later this semester when we get into cell signaling and the regulation of skeletal muscle mass. But for now, just realize that, that you can go to a gym and perform resistance training, do it consistently for years, and never activate your high threshold motor units. And those high threshold motor units are filled with muscle fibers that are more sensitive to hypertrophic signaling. Uh, so if you're not performing your resistance training correctly, uh, it's not going to actualize the ambitions of your New Year's resolution. And depending on how it's performed, it might, it's possible, it might even elicit atrophy in some fibers. Um, you should already know enough about size principle to understand how to make your training more effective, but this is a topic we will return to later this semester. Now, as we age, uh, if we either don't do resistance training or if we do it poorly, incorrectly, we're going to experience atrophy. Um, and this is a study here that we saw in lecture nine, but let's remind ourselves of its message. You get into your later years and you're likely to see a decrease in the number of motor units. Um, muscle fibers themselves vanish, but the motor nerves supplying them vanish too. Annually, maybe you'll lose 1% of them. Uh, you know, once you hit your wrinkling years, you know, get into the 50s. And unless there's some good exercise inputs, they're going to be vanishing. Um, and I'll return to this topic in, in just a minute. But first, let's talk some more about GABA. As we age, GABA receptors tend to decline in parts of the brain. GABA A and GABA B, these are receptor subtypes. Um, a is ionotropic, B is metabotropic. Those are terms that you don't need to know now, but they will come up later this semester. We'll talk about them in detail later. Uh, but for now, just know that we see some GABA GABA-related changes in the brain as we get older, and these will affect motor capacity, skeletal muscle function. Uh, now, when you look at serum levels of GABA, uh, that seems to increase with age modestly, but statistically significantly. And these changes in GABA concentration um, and in GABA receptors uh, and in how our GABA behaves, this provides an explanation, one of many, it's not the only explanation, but it is a good explanation for how older adults gradually lose the ability to effectively regulate the excitability of their skeletal muscle. 
Uh, now, GABA levels also influence athletic performance uh, because athleticism is not just commitment to a task. It's not just excitatory action. It involves inhibition too. Um, it involves changing your plan. Uh, you think it's going to be a fastball or, or you know, but then here comes a change up. Um, you have to change your initial plan by suppressing the initial action. And the example that's given in pretty much every article is crossing the street. Okay, you look both ways and then you start walking. Uh, you've committed to that decision, but then you hear like screeching tires. And do you just keep walking because that's the decision you made uh, and you're just going to stick to it no matter what? Or do you suppress that commitment? If you have a healthy GABA system, you should be able to abort that cross the street plan and replace it with something new. Uh, here's a different article that uses that same cross the street analogy. Uh, but there are two kinds of inhibition to consider. There's reactive inhibition and proactive inhibition. Proactive inhibition would involve us preparing to abort at any second. Uh, I'm going to move this wet toaster out of the sink. Uh, you know, if it shocks me, I'm, I'm ready to pull my hands away, but I am going to try to move this wet electronic thing with my bare hands. You know, that's proactive inhibition. Uh, a spinal reflex would be involved there, so it's not a very good example, but you get the idea. Proactive inhibition, plan to abort the action. Reactive inhibition, unanticipated abortion. Um, and there are some um, conditions right that are that are associated with deficits in control uh, like Tourette syndrome but as we age all of us gradually lose reactive inhibitory function we can't regulate GABA a or GABA B inhibition as well uh, and our motor performance is compromised uh, compromised in a number of settings um Think about like martial arts uh, and combat sports. I don't know why this little you know, fencing girl is taking her mask off mid-lunge, but fencing is a good example because if you commit to a lunge or any other attack or defense and you realize it's not going to work, it's hard to abort those actions safely unless your reaction is immediate. Uh, or if it's baseball, right, and you're going to steal. You're going to steal second base and you're on first base. Um, you're going to steal as soon as the windup begins. Once you commit to running, a young athlete may be able to uncommit rapidly, but an older athlete may have a small amount of lag in reactive inhibition, so the pickoff is easier. Um, this is one area where younger athletes may be able to exploit uh, when playing older opponents who otherwise play the game smarter owing to more experience, but they can be tricked. Returning to this idea of motor unit loss, uh, as we get older, past our 50s, when we're losing these, these uh, motor neurons, some of the muscle fibers left behind in that motor unit may disintegrate. You lose those fibers, but others are picked up by axonal sprouting. So what we see in older adults is fewer total motor units, but each motor neuron may have more total fibers in it. Um, because the neurons that have survived have accumulated fibers from the lost and found over the years. And lots of those uh, fibers will be neighbors as opposed to being distributed throughout the tissue. So in older adults, in addition to having compromised reactive inhibition, they may have worse fine motor control owing to uh, the motor unit composition. Some other things to consider uh, when generating force, when you're trying to reach maximum voluntary contraction, you're trying to achieve optimal performance. Um, the first is that afferents affect efferents. During pain, your force output will be lower. Uh, if you've ever been kicked in the shin and then you try to walk on it afterward, your leg can barely bear your weight. Um, it's not like you lost muscle mass in the kick and got weaker. It's just pain. It's you, you, your, your leg is in pain. Um, now this article here is not about shins. It's about low back pain. It's an article we'll return to in future lectures, this exact one. But the premise is 
in contexts of pain, we recruit muscles differently. Now, some of this is conscious. We're deliberately avoiding movements that associate with pain, or, or maybe we have a fear of re-injury. Uh, but also, there's an unconscious change that takes place. You're in no control over the different motor patterns that develop in the presence of pain and injury. Um, you see it in the rotator cuff and people with shoulder injuries. Uh, you see it in the quads of people with patellofemoral pain syndrome. Uh, whatever pain is, is, is being experienced, wherever it is, um, you'll see afferents affecting efferents. The temperature also affects skeletal muscle performance. Uh, peak force development rate, how quickly you can reach peak force, will be slower in colder environments. So a vertical jump in the frost will not be as high as a vertical jump on a summer afternoon. Uh, now, cold weather is great if you're an endurance athlete. Maintenance of core temperature is really important in marathons and, and triathlons and long soccer matches and other similar performances. Um, you'll, you'll dissipate heat better if it's not blazing heat that you're trying to dissipate it into. Uh, but if you're a shot putter, cold weather can be compromising to your performance. Uh, now, it's not just pain and injury and, and temperature and potentially illness that affect muscle contraction. Fatigue matters too. Uh, there's an electromechanical delay between the onset of stimulation and the onset of force. And researchers will use EMG, electromyography, to measure the electrical activity in muscles. Um, and then they'll use MMG, mechanomyography, to capture the change in muscle shape to, to identify the point in which contraction begins. And then they'll also measure force output. Uh, so they can see when stimulation begins and then the course that muscle takes as it contracts and produces force. And the impetus for, for movement uh, does not correspond to immediate movement. And fatigue, depending on the nature of that fatigue, will stretch that interstice a little bit. Um, like performing in a frozen day, uh, fatigue can cause a delay on peak force development rate. Uh, and there's a lot of additional reading on this topic if you're interested in it, if you're interested in the effect of fatigue on motor performance. But the summary is it compromises it. Um, even if you're only fatiguing the lower threshold motor units, it still takes longer to orderly recruit your way through those fibers to the top. So let's come up uh, for air for a minute and, and think about a scenario. Go shopping okay, all day. Uh, accompany your family to every store in the mall. Uh, I mean, you're buying toys for your kids or your nephews and nieces or whatever. You're looking at shoes and, and sunglasses and linens, and whatever else exists in the mall. You're shopping for that stuff for like five hours. Um, until your feet are aching and you just I hate the people you're with and you want to go home and sit because you're tired. Okay, do that. Um, and then um, after that, when you're all done with it, put on a track suit and give me your best 100 meter dash. Is your time going to be better before or after the mall experience? Holding all other variables constant. Um, it's an interesting question because the only thing you've fatigued is type one fibers. Nothing you did in the mall activated a single type two fiber. I mean, they were just lounging the whole time. Your type two fibers slept through your entire mall trip. They're totally fresh, pristine, museum quality, mint condition on eBay. Um, and the contraction velocity of your type one fibers isn't fast enough to really impact your sprint speed in your type two uh, motor units, that's that's what's responsible for that. But still, you'll be slower. Um, you're not gonna set a PR if your sprint is preceded by a long, generally fatiguing mall trip. Now, lots of variables can contribute here. Uh, we'll talk about some of this stuff later in the semester, but think about push starting my old Celica. Okay, let's say 
let's say you're going to do the quarter mile as fast as you can in the car, right? 17, 18 seconds, whatever it is. But in this case, you have to push start it. So you get behind it. There's a quarter mile straight away ahead of you and you start pushing. And once you get it up to speed, the engine fires. Those are your type two fibers and it can start speeding down the track. But if the push start is slower, your quarter mile time is going to be slower. And we know that fatigue causes an electromechanical delay. So let's put our practical application into more practical terms. You're a baseball player or you're a softball player uh, and your team is up to bat. What should you do, right? Should you stand up against the fence and cheer? Um, you know, don't sit down when your teammate is batting. You know, that's bad luck or it's poor sportsmanship or it's lazy or it's unsupportive or whatever. Should you do that? Um, or should you sit down like the lower pictures? Like you don't have to sit in a pile of trash, you know, and, and and look defeated, but but sit and rest. What should you do? It's an important question to baseball and softball players and their coaches, right? Um, these players, they spend half the game in the dugout. Either the top or the bottom of every single inning is spent there. And your behavior in the dugout can have a huge influence on the outcome of the game. Um, if you want to work with athletes, and if winning is something you're interested in, understanding muscle physiology is critical. Uh, so the answer is obviously you should sit in a pile of your own like festering garbage and relax. You should not be up against the fence shouting and chanting and cheering and gripping the fence to like keep you upright because you're so fatigued. That's a mall trip right? You, you simulate shopping every store in the mall without ever leaving the dugout. But then you get up to bat, okay? And, you're, and your type one fibers are all fatigued. And you expect to beat out an infield single, right? You, do you expect to stretch a single into a double? Do you expect to steal a base? But right? you might have been able to do all of those things if you weren't fatigued. And any one of them might have won the game if it was even close. Uh, but instead, the players were shouting at the batter, overshooting the batter's adrenal system to no benefit whatsoever. Probably that's harmful, uh, depending. Um, so they themselves, so the shouters themselves could fail to outrun a slow grounder to third base. If you do this, um, unless it's just a blowout in one direction or the other, you're pretty much throwing the game. And these are the kinds of lessons we can learn from muscle physiology, human performance physiology and related disciplines. Um, and you can use your understanding of physiology uh, to think about other aspects of play as well. Uh, if you want to throw a baseball harder or put the shot, you know, two feet farther, how do you do that? Well, you need to activate those fibers responsibly, right? Lift heavy. Don't do very many reps. Don't go to failure. The type two X's are the first to de-recruit. Uh, so don't bother with the spotter. Don't do the drop sets where you strip the weight and keep going. Sport-specific training requires an understanding of physiology. So let's say you're a pitcher. You're on the mound. You wind up and exert as much force as you can once. You don't heave 10 reps at the catcher. That would be a balk right? Advance the runners, like as far as they go. That's not just like to home, like that's go to your houses. The game's over. That's an impressive balk. Um, pitchers do one rep sets. Okay. And then they wait a minute, 30 seconds, a minute, whatever. And then they do one more max power output rep, then wait another minute and do another. How do you train for that? Well, you know, I'm going to pitch seven innings. So I need endurance for one rep sets? No, you don't. Okay, You just need mechanical integrity. You need tissues that can withstand rapid acceleration and deceleration. And that has nothing to do with oxidative efficiency. In a baseball pitch, your type one fibers aren't contributing um, in a meaningful way, really. I mean, they contribute to standing there, your standing posture. That's a bunch of type ones. But the velocity of the pitch that's type twos and training those is what's important. Um, so you should be thinking about every athletic context in the same way. The more you understand physiology, the better coach or athlete you'll be. In the last lecture, we talked about bench press and how during a 10 RM, the second rep is easier than the first. 
Um, let's think about adaptation during a bench press. Uh, if someone asks you to spot them and they insist you help them perform forced reps, ask them what their goal is. If it's for hypertrophy, that's okay. Uh, you're getting a larger immune system response, more chemical signaling. Um, you know, but if the goal is hypertrophy, why are you doing bench press in the first place? Uh, and if your goal is strength, why are you doing it like that? Uh, it, maybe the goal is muscular endurance. You know, they could be a wrestler and they need to express strength 90 seconds in. Um, you know, how might they make the stresses of their exercise or replicate the demands of their sport? Uh, or maybe it's a basketball player and, and rebounding is important to their game. Should they be doing 12 rep sets? Should they be jogging? Uh, should they do squats before plyometric exercises? This will all influence recruitment characteristics, potentially in a disadvantageous way. Uh, so how about stretching, right? Should you stretch before performance? depends on the performance. If what you plan to do next is more stretching, then yes, definitely. But if you expect to express strength or power, then I'd be careful. Uh, we tend to experience poor neural activation uh, of the recently stretched tissue for a bit. Uh, and what's called the series elastic and ser the, the parallel elastic components, um, the, the stretchy stuff in, in the muscle tendon unit, this gets stretched out. And that makes them less elastic for a time, which compromises stretch shortening for that time. Uh, now, warming up is good, uh, but static stretching doesn't have a warming effect. Metabolic activity is what causes heat to be released. Um, now, the purpose of, of static stretching, this should also be considered. So why are people doing it before athletic competitions? Um, if it's to reduce the risk of subsequent injury, that's not a benefit of pre-performance stretching. Uh, now, stretching is is a uh, useful intervention for numerous chronic injuries, um, and physical therapists can, can, can work wonders uh, by stretching and strengthening very specific muscles, uh, but the kinds of injuries people assume stretching prevents are not prevented. Uh, resistance training is much more effective. Uh, this is a meta-analysis that, that compares stretching, proprioceptive training, and resistance training uh, in their effect on injury incidents. And strength training is the most effective, which makes sense because you're remodeling tissues to withstand more destructive loads. So summing up pre-performance stretching, um, static stretching is bad. Uh, but warming up is good, and warming up through a full range of motion is probably fine, probably helpful. And it's also fine to have rituals that neither impair nor enhance performance. Um, just watch Nomar Garcia Parra's old pre-batting procedure. I, I, he would go through a complicated series of motions that had no physiological basis, but it was part of his mental preparation. And people have similar rituals when they're mentally preparing for a free throw, uh, you know, or any other athletic feat. Um, and those are all fine. Um, but it, maybe it would be finer if that uh, pre-performance activity took advantage of post-activation potentiation. So this is a phenomenon in which Previous use of your muscle tissue facilitates enhanced subsequent use. Um, do a set of squats, okay, just a few reps, not to failure, um, and then do a vertical jump. You'll jump higher, not because you're warmed up, you're barely warmer. Um, you just did a couple of heavy squats ahead of time. Um, but that permits you to jump higher, especially in type 2 athletes, um, especially performing uh, type two uh, musculature, th those sorts of motions. Um, and it's more than just ANSI nerves. Uh, one mechanism is phosphorylation of myosin regulatory light chains. Uh, this makes the contractile unit more sensitive to calcium. And you know calcium's role in, in sliding filament theory. Um, Crossbridge cycling uh, rate seems to be enhanced a bit. Um, now, it's studied almost exclusively in athletes, and it seems to be a phenomenon that isn't particularly trainable or alterable, meaning uh, you can't train enough 
uh, to where you can do away with the need to keep doing these sets. You still need to do it before every expression of strength. Um, and there are multiple proposed mechanisms, but this chips away a little bit at that claim of athletes being able to train their way out of size principle. Um, now, it doesn't last very long. Post-activation performance enhancement, um, that doesn't last very long. You know, maybe 30 seconds, maybe, a, I don't know, a couple of minutes, depending on a lot of factors. Uh, but exercise um, induces fatigue at the same time. If you're exercising, you're not just enhancing performance, you're also fatiguing. So finding a balance between performance compromise and performance enhancement takes a little bit of careful execution. So the last point I want to make is that like this concept of, quote, functional exercise, um, take into consideration everything you've learned so far and try to figure out what is meant by functional when people apply that name to exercises like the one shown. Will this help me move a washer and dryer out of a storage unit? Uh, will it help me distribute a bag of mulch over my garden? Will it help me carry a heavy bag of groceries up the stairs? What functional um, kind of task of daily living is this addressing? What task requires one to be balanced a foot above the ground, supine, stabilizing three pound weights at arm's length? Um, and the same question could be raised about bench press, you know, as it applies to sport, whatever sport it is, especially if you're wearing a bench shirt uh, or maybe you're squatting in a squat belt um, or you're doing pull-ups with wrist straps. You know, in what sport can you wear these devices? Um, or think about performing like a long, slow cardio. Is that applicable to tennis or boxing or basketball or even soccer? And questions like this will lead us into our next topic, which is specificity of adaptation. Uh, but for this lecture, here are the questions you should be able to answer and maybe reflect on a little bit. And I'll see you uh, in the next lecture where we start getting into specificity of adaptation.